Good morning and happy Father's Day. If we'd stand, we'll get started with singing, He Has Made Me Glad. Or I will be. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is a day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I read to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have um, overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you so much that we're allowed to call you Father. You who are perfect, perfect in love, perfect in righteousness, perfect in grace and mercy, perfect in all your ways, Lord. And though we have frail and, and failed representatives of you on earth, you are consistent. And you have always been there for us to lift us up and to redeem us. And for this we are grateful. We pray, Lord, today that we will understand you better. We will serve you more. We will fall more deeply in love with you. We pray, God, today that you will move among us and draw people towards your heart. Let them know that you love them and that Jesus Christ can save them. And that today could be a new day for them. A new beginning. Because they've come to know you as their Savior. So we pray for all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. And we do want to wish you a happy Father's Day here at Travis Baptist Church. Um, and uh, so, uh, Laura Lee, you and the kids have some presentations to make, so come on up here for that. So, happy Father's Day to all of the wonderful fathers in our church. And first of all, we want to pray, uh, want to uh, say happy Father's Day to our Father in heaven. He's the Father, um, his faithful Father, um, the giver of, of all good things, very providing Father to his children. And uh, we, uh, we are also very thankful for the fathers in our, our lives, right? So uh, I am so blessed to have a good father. Um, he's not perfect, but God, uh, uh, God gave me a, a good father for, to provide for everything that I need. So um, we, uh, the role of a father is incredibly important in a child's life. And, uh, I noticed that when my, my nephew was uh, growing up, uh, one of the first words that he says is like so simple. It's just Abba, right? Abba, 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 right? So, so simple. And that's the word of, that represents a father, right? I noticed it's like this kid, uh, just the, the first word that he says is Abba, right? Abba, you know, it's very, very simple. No, no, no. Uh, 
then there's no need for uh, a little bit more uh, difficult articulation. But I think that's the reason God wants us to consider him our Abba, our Father, that um, and uh, he, he gave us wonderful Father too. And we are blessed in our church to have wonderful men that uh, have been a good example of fathers in our congregations. And uh, um, with the situation in the world right now, there's so many uh, there's so many young men that are lacking good role models, uh, the, the roles of fathers in our church um, for, for young men or young women to look up uh, to is incredibly important. Um, we, I was thinking about this analogy, right? Uh, mother is always somebody who likes to hug, always bring the children in, but father is somebody who likes to push, you know, push the children, and then, yes, you can do better, yes, you can, you, you are better than what you think, right? The father always gives us confidence, um, give us, you know, you are, you are precious, you are, you are good enough, you, you can do it, so uh, I just feel that that's, that's the way that, you know, that's why a child needs both mother and father. And, uh, in our church, we have, uh, like I said before, they, we are blessed with a lot of men that are so dedicated, uh, always um, uh, come up to the uh, to fill the the need in our church. Yeah, many there's many needs in our church. Uh, the need to uh, from different kinds of ministries, uh, the ministry for um, like even the building ministry, uh, the building uh, preservation ministry uh, alone, it needs a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of hard works and a lot of men, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, people that is, uh, that is dedicated to not only able but also willing to, to help uh, maintain the church. So. This is a very important, and then also uh, the role of visitations, uh, and then the, uh, the deacons. So, so today we would like to honor one man in our church that has been so faithful. He is a good role model. He uh, he is a good father, grandfather, great grandfather. And um, whenever our pastor needs needs help, uh, our pastor himself said that I can always count on counting on this this uh, this uh, this man that in. This uh, man, and he also served our country as a marine, and uh, so we really, really want to uh, appreciate Mr. Jesse Perez uh, as being a wonderful role model in our church. So, so uh, one of the child, uh, if Mr. Jesse Perez don't mind to stand up, and then one of the child is going to give a special gift to to you, right? So he's the man that stand up, right? He is somebody who always there to whenever we we present the need for help. He's always there to to like yeah. This is me. I'm gonna help. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, for all of the fathers in our church, we also have special gifts. Uh, the children um, have like a, a keychain, blue keychain to to give away to all of the men in our church. So if you have not gotten one, uh, please uh, let us know. We want to give. We want to make sure every fathers in our church have have the have the gift a keychain from from us, so from our church. Thank you and God bless you and continue to be a wonderful father and that depends on our heavenly fathers to to minister to your, to your children. May God bless you. Thank you. Okay. All right, and we got a few, <clears throat> excuse me, a few announcements of things coming up. Um, it is Father's Day today, so there won't be any evening activities up here. We'll give you time to spend with your family. Then uh, Wednesday night, we will be having our usual uh, Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesday at 630 um, this coming Saturday, the 22nd, we're going to have a work day here at the church. On the back of your bulletin, there's a list of things we kind of need to do. And what, as you look at that list, you might think, okay, well, I might need this tool. I've got a sedge of loppers or a chainsaw or something. And uh, would love for you to come and help us out a little bit. Um, 
and uh, there's even a couple of cleaning projects that can be done so we would be grateful for your presence this Saturday we're going to try and go from 8 till noon uh, may try and be done earlier than that because it's going to get hot so uh, please keep that in mind also um, we're going to do a special potluck uh, in honor of 4th of July. We're going to do it on July the 7th uh, on a Sunday evening. July the 7th, our Celebrate America Fellowship and Potluck. So please keep that in mind and get that on your calendar. We have 140 kids registered for our shoe ministry. And so that means we've got 40 or 50 more spots left. If you have not gotten your kids or grandkids or neighbor's kids or people you know, uh, please get them uh, the, the QR, uh, QR code is on the back of your bulletin to get them registered. And uh, we still have a few openings there for our volunteers. Uh, the sign-up sheets are out there on the little table, little brown table. And so please let us know how you can help. Also, do you have an announcement? Okay. Huh? Quick announcement. Okay. Come on then. Yep. Mm-hmm. Adele and I have been wanting to um, plan more, get together little mini fellowships and stuff. And so um, on Tuesday the 25th, um, we're going to do a tote bag painting party. Um, I have the signs up on the uprights and out in the hallways. There's about nine designs that you can choose from. We'll supply all the supplies. Um, but come fellowship, have fun, and um, RSVP by the 21st because we need to make sure we get everything uh, design-wise figured out for you guys. So uh, they're just cute little tote bags that we're just going to make. Thanks. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, there's a, a couple of posters out there and uh, uh, do come and participate in this, ladies. It might be fun. All right. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. We might be busy that night, right? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, in light of all that, we're trying to get some things going around here. So we do have a, a, if you're with us for the first time or the first time in a long time, Deidre's back with us again. We're glad to see her. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, so... Please, uh, we wouldn't mind you filling out one of these and dropping it in the offering plate when it comes by later. And uh, if you need to update address, phone number, emails, any of those things, you can use that also. Prayer requests, all of that stuff. All right? And uh, at this time, let's go around and welcome one another into the Lord's house.
we make it back to our places, we will continue to stand. As we make it back, join me in singing the heart of worship. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. At this time, the children may be excused to head up to Children's Church. As they head out, the rest will sing, He Keeps Me Singing. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of thy ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife, tears could fill my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stood my slumbering towards again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. 
city's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky i shall wing my flight to worlds unknown i shall reign with him on high jesus 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 sweet his name i know Please be seated. It's time for us to pray for one another, to lift up our burdens to the Lord, to share with Him all the pains, all the struggles we've been going through. Some of us have been going through a lot. Some of us are facing some challenges. We're not sure how we're going to do. But we do know He can get us through. And so we turn to Him right now. If you want to come to this altar and pray, maybe that will help a little bit. Feel like, yes, I'm approaching God's throne. I'm coming before Him with all my problems, my struggles, my wounds, and I've I, I got to pour them out to Him. We invite you to come. If you want someone to pray with you, we're up here. But this is a time we take to speak to Him honestly about all that concerns us, all our anxieties, all the things that are weighing us down. Come and pray. Let's bow our heads together. Our Father who is in heaven, your name is holy. And we stand before you, weak and frail, hurting, broken, wondering, filled with worry, not knowing where life is going right now. And we need your help. But because you allow us to call you Father, we know this, that you allow us to come into your resources. Because you allow us to call us Father, we're part of your family. And we are heirs of your kingdom. And we belong here. We don't deserve it, but we belong. And that is an amazing thing that your son Jesus did for us. And so we stand before you, Lord, to say we need you. Father, we're out of resources. We're out of money. We're out of time. We're out of strength. We're out of emotions. We're out of everything we need to get through these days. Lord, we need You. We need You, Father, to give us Your wisdom, to pour into us Your Spirit, to strengthen us, to lead us, to open up doors that we cannot to push us forward when we want to drag our feet. We need you, Father. We need you to take us by the hand or by the nap of the neck if it's necessary and take us where you need us to go, to places where you need us to be so we can be all that you're calling us to be. That seems like such a far way to go right now. 
But yet, Lord, you're, you're here. You've not abandoned us. And you're not letting go of us. And so we reach up and we cry, Abba, Father. We're your adopted children. We know that the riches of your glory are far beyond our imagination. And you have plenty of resources to heal and to strengthen and to provide. And so we pray that you will. We pray for each person who's crying out to you right now that they need you, Lord, that you would grant them the desires of their heart. And they're learning to delight themselves in you. They're learning to be, to enjoy you as a father. God, we pray for them. We pray for the men of this church that they will answer the call that you have for us, that we will fulfill the responsibilities that you've given us, that we will be loving husbands and fathers, that we will be faithful servants to you. And through all of this, Lord, you will be glorified in us. That truly is our goal. We want to see you high and lifted up. Lord, help us. Heal us. Do those things that only you can do. And God, we pray. We pray for those that are hurting. Lord, they need you. Wrap your arms around them. Sit down with them, Lord, and remind them that you will never forsake them. We pray these things. All these things in the name of your Son, Christ. Amen. Join me in singing, Share His Love. The love of God is broader than His vast expanse. It is deeper and wider than the sea. Love reaches out to all to bring abundant life. For God so loved the world, His only Son He gave. Share His love by telling what the Lord has done for you. Share His love by sharing of your faith. And show Jesus Christ is real to you every moment, every day. All those who have trusted in God's only Son and hold this precious treasure in their hearts, seek ways to make it known to all who need to know. That God so loved the world, His only Son He gave. Share His love by telling what the Lord has done for you. Share His love by sharing of your faith. And show the world that Jesus Christ is real to you every moment, every day. We show the love of God each day we live. Reveal Christ's presence in our lives and how the Holy Spirit guides us day by day. For God so loved the world, His only Son He gave. Share His love by telling what the Lord has done for you. Share His love by sharing of your faith. And show the world that Jesus Christ is real to you every moment, every day. 
At this time, let us stand for our offering as we sing, stand up and bless the Lord. Stand up and bless the Lord, ye people of his choice. Stand up and bless the Lord your God with heart and soul and voice. Through high above all praise, above all blessings high, who would not bear his hope? Our lips, our minds inspire, and wing to heaven our thought. God is our strength and song, and his salvation hearts. Then be his love when Christ proclaimed with all our ransom power. Excuse me. <laughs> Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the blessing. We thank you for your mercy and grace, Father. Thank you for today as we celebrate Father's Day, dear Lord. But we remember that you are the greatest Father ever for us. Just continue to bless us, Father. Bless this time. Also, dear Lord, help us to give more than what we can in our hearts, Father. Just continue to allow us to give to you, dear Lord. We, we can never over give, Father, but we praise you that this time that we can actually do it out of obedience and our obligation to you. We love you, Father. Forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right, if you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in Romans chapter 10. We're continuing our study on the book of Romans and being more than a conqueror. And a uh, strange thing that if you want change in your life, what you need is an unchanging message. And uh, we're going to talk about that today because sometimes we keep thinking there's a big difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there kind of is. But they're not separated. They're telling the same story. There's a lot of commonality between them. And what I mean by that is don't abandon your Old Testament because the Old New Testament's easier for you. Um, a lot of our message, a lot of blessing, a lot of where we're coming from begins in the Old Testament and continues in the New. And Romans chapter 10 makes that pretty clear to us. Um, while you're turning there, and uh, we're going to read verses 3 through 13. I realize that's a little bit lengthy. Some of y'all, I know, have difficulty standing. We understand that. But let us, we're going to read Romans 10, verses 3 through 13. And if you would stand, please, for the reading of God's Word, if that's comfortable for you, okay? Romans chapter 10, we'll begin in verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Verse 7, Or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for these words, and we pray, God, to, to, that, that we hear from you today. Speak to our hearts, change our minds, grow us closer to you. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. Um, and as we consider the book of Romans, we've been in it for quite a while, and uh, there's just a lot here. And we've been talking about how powerful the gospel is, and keeping in mind that the book of Romans was written to people who were Jewish, and so there's a lot of stuff in there about law and, and righteousness and all these things that can confuse us sometimes. But what we want to understand is we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, all right? Some of this stuff might be difficult to wade through. But what we want to say is this, is we've got one continuous story going from cover to cover in this book we call the Bible. Many people like to say things like, well, I don't care for the Old Testament because the Old Testament's done away with when Jesus rose from the grave, and so they ignore it. Not realizing that Jesus quoted the Old Testament all the time. When he looked for strength from his father while being tempted, he quoted the Old Testament. When he was hanging upon the cross, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting the Old Testament. He's showing us that it has a lot of value for us. And I say this because as we've gone through Romans, we've seen, sure does quote the Old Testament a lot. Yes, it does. Because that's really our faith is simply not something different, but the continuation of the faith of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Our faith is a continuation of the preaching ministry of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Malachi and on down the line through the rest of the prophets. Our Christian experience is reflected in the Psalms and in the Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes and all through there. It still speaks to us today. 
And that's why we call it an unchanging message. It's not like God said, well, in the Old Testament, you've got to keep all the rules to be one of my people. Okay, now in the New Testament, you just got to believe in Christ. No, as we saw even back in Romans chapter 4 when we were studying there, the faith of Abraham, he's the father of all who believe. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. You and I, if we believe in the Lord, we become righteous. It's the same faith. And Romans 10 does a good job, I think, of pointing this out, that what he's been building up to is this faith of ours. It is one big happy family from Genesis to Revelation. It is one big happy book. My, we, we, we see contradictions or inconsistencies, but yet if we start to take it as a whole, we begin to realize it's all there for us. And it really is consistent. And there's not contradictions. There may be different points of view or different perspectives of the same event. But you've got one solid, consistent message through the whole Bible. And as such, that tells us it's something we can depend on. You're living in a world where your children, gentlemen, are being tempted to not believe in this book anymore where it's being called fairy tales, where it's being called just another piece of ancient literature that has no relevance. It's being attacked. It's being degraded. Uh, even some of those who claim to love it openly disobey it. Too many of us are God's people, and we say we believe in the Bible, but we don't live the Bible. But God comes to us and says, look, this book has power. This book gives you hope. This book can change you. The message it brings can give you a new life if you'll believe it. Because it reveals to us God and His will. So we're going to say this as we start out this morning. First off, whenever you do read your Bible, when you read the Old Testament, read it in the light of Christ, Jesus. What do I mean by that? It's okay. To sit there and realize, all right, we know about Jesus, but David really didn't in the Old Testament. Moses really didn't. But when we read their words, we put Jesus in there. Is that legitimate? Yes, it is. It's good to realize that as you read your Old Testament, what does this mean in the light that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins and rose from the grave and now reigns with the Father? In other words, Jesus after he rose from the dead, was walking on the road to Emmaus with a couple of disciples, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning themselves. That's Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And by re with those words, can you imagine? Here's Jesus starting from Genesis, basically, which is one of the books of Moses. And all through his Old Testament, this stuff was pointing you towards me. The Passover lamb, the scapegoat, Joseph being persecuted by his brothers, the prophets as they spoke of me as the suffering servant, that it was me who was led to the slaughter without a word. It's me that it's by my stripes you will be healed, as Isaiah prophesied. And in walking through the Old Testament, he's showing them it all pointed to me. So, and this gives you and I the permission, as we read the Old Testament, say, wait a minute, what does this say in light of Christ now? When we read through Leviticus and we see all those detailed sacrifices, do you realize that's all because our sin requires so much attention but the glorious thing was that one day, one time, one Passover lamb, one sacrificial lamb, one perfectly pure spotless lamb named Jesus Christ died for us. All of that was to point us and to prepare us and to open our eyes so that when Jesus came, he wasn't just saying something completely new. He was using word pictures and illustrations that they were familiar with so that they could understand what God was talking about. In the book of Romans, a chapter or two later, chapter 15, it says this. If I can click there, there we go. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, 
that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. These words laid out to us that we would learn, that we would learn from David and Moses, that we would learn from Rebecca and from Deborah and from Esther and from Ruth, that we would learn and through the comfort of the scriptures that we would realize, hey, every one of those folks, though they did not ultimately receive God's promise of the Messiah, they kept pushing forward. They kept pursuing it. They're the example for us. Now we're saying all that to say this. Here in chapter 10 of the book of Romans, he's going to refer a lot to the Old Testament to say, and this is the message we were trying to get across to you all those centuries. Verse 3. We were ignorant of God's righteousness. And we sought to establish our own righteousness. What is he talking about? When we go back to the Old Testament and we look at what was going on there and all through your Bible, we find out that our faith has never changed. It is still a faith that needs to be put in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's still a faith that needs to be put in a God who loves us. It's still a faith that trusts the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. For instance, how has our faith never changed? First off, our problem is the same. Looking at verse 3 and 4. All right. They were ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness. What is you and I's biggest problem? We think we're fine. We think we can be perfect. We think we're good enough. I'm not as bad as that guy over there. I may not be perfect, but I'm not as bad as that guy over there. And what's happening is, is that we're trying to establish our own righteousness. That God, if he's loving, if he's a good father, every father knows he's got imperfect children. Every father knows, and his kids are not the best, but he's got to love them anyway. And the father looks down on us, and he's supposed to love us anyway. But in, look what it says in verse 3. In seeking to establish their own righteousness, that we're good enough, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. See, my dad had a set of rules. Now, I don't know you kids today, but back then, we always thought our parents were old-fashioned because they grew up in the Depression, and they had bathrooms that were outside the house, and they didn't always have running water. And we always thought, yeah, yeah, Dad, you got your old way of doing things. But his old way of doing things included things like being honest, get up in the morning, make your bed, learn to work, and all of those things that children needed from their father. A work ethic. The impetus to, to push forward. A standard to a strive to. An example to follow. Fathers give us that. But a lot of us look at God and think of... Because you know how it is when we're teenagers. Our parents become the most ignorant people we've ever met in our life. Everything they say, everything they do is just embarrassing to us and makes no sense to us. And we sit there and we're trying to spread our wings and say, look, I'm 15, I know everything. I am going to live my life whether you like it or not. And I'm going to live it this way. And in seeking to establish our own way of living, we have what? Violated his. And then a few years pass, we find out really somehow by the time I turned 22, dad got a lot smarter than he was when I was 15. How did that happen? He didn't go to school. But we learn, don't they? Don't we? And that's the picture of us as Christians. We think God's got too many rules. We think he's a little bit too stringent. We think he's too conservative. And I want to do my thing. But in seeking to establish our own righteousness, we don't submit to his. We don't want to submit to his way of living. We want to be on our own. And this has always been mankind's problem. Because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. In other words, Jesus is the way. The way you get righteous. It's not by making up your own rules. It's not by doing things your way. It's by a submission to Jesus Christ. And how does he establish this? He refers to his Old Testament. And how it points us to the solution. 
as we see in verse 5, Moses, remember, the old guy from the Old Testament, he writes about the righteousness which is of the law, that the man who does these things shall live by them. In other words, if you want to go that route, you better go that route all the way. James puts it this way, that if we sin in one sin, if we sin in one area, we've broken all the law. How would you feel if you, you know, you go down Weber Road, if you're going 40 miles an hour, the limit's 35, and so you're going too, too fast. I know that. I got a ticket once about 16 years ago. What if that being guilty of speeding made you also guilty of kidnapping and of murder and of stealing? That they're just going to, as we would say, throw the entire book at you. And yet this, in a sense, is what has happened when we violate God's law. That once we break one area, as James says, we've broken all of it. Well, should I just go ahead and break all of it then, Because since I'm already guilty? No, that's not the point. The point is this, is righteousness is going to come through Jesus. You're only escaped from that condemnation and that, that penalty of that sin is to come to Jesus Christ. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for all who believe. So he quotes from the Old Testament there in Deuteronomy. He says, the man who does these things shall live by them. Verse 6, but the righteousness which is of faith speaks in this way. And he's going to make a reference here to Deuteronomy chapter 30, going back to his Old Testament. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, in verse 7, who shall descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. If you want to look up, starting in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11, that's where this comes from. And he starts out by saying, you know, I'm trying to get you people to obey me, but you don't want to. You act like it's something hard, something mysterious. It's like, you know... Have you ever had a child and you explain to them three times, you take the trash out by taking out the trash, putting it in the garbage can, and putting a new liner in the trash can. You're not done taking out the trash until you put it in the new plastic bag, right? Right. Okay. And they stare at you and wonder why you're mad that they only took the trash bag to the front door or they didn't put the liner in. They did not do the whole job. And they stare at you and say, but you didn't tell me to do all of it. Or I don't remember you telling me that you ever run into that. And isn't that us with God? Because God says, look, follow me, obey me. And it's not like it's something hard and mysterious is what he's saying in Deuteronomy 30. In fact, he says, do you have to go all the way up to heaven to get it? No, you don't. Or as Paul says in verse 6, do you do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven? That's like bring Christ down from above so we can get the instructions. Then in verse 7, do we have to go down to the abyss? If you read in Deuteronomy, it talks about going down into the sea, the deep. Do you have to go looking for it real hard to find out what it was I said? I sat there and said it to you straight looking at you and you paid no attention to me. You don't have to go all the way up to heaven. You don't have to go all the way to the deep parts of the sea. But what does it say? Verse 8. He continues from Deuteronomy 30 and says, The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. In other words, God's made this simple. Everything you need to do comes with your mouth and with your heart. Obey me with your voice by saying, Yes, Lord. Obey me from the heart. Essentially is what he's saying in Deuteronomy. So now, look what he does with this. Verse 8, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, and that is the word of faith which we proclaim. Remember, mouth and heart. So what happens? Verse 9, that if you believe, or with your, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not something hard. What is it? With your mouth, you confess 
the Lord Jesus. I need you as my Lord Jesus. I want you as my Lord Jesus. I need you, Jesus. And with the heart you believe that God raised him from the dead. And what happens? You shall be saved. This is what he's saying in Deuteronomy and this is what he's saying in Romans. That yes, both your mouth and your heart. That you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart, you shall be saved. That was the message of the Old Testament. That's the message we've got for you now. And this message has not changed in all of those centuries. Our solution then is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Very simple. Well, Pastor, most of us in here already believe. But what we want you to understand is that this faith runs through the whole Bible. And even as we begin to see here, our mission is going to be in it also. Our mission as a church, the reason we gather here, that hasn't changed either. He tells us in verses 10 and 11, with the heart we believe in the righteousness and the mouth confession is made to salvation. Then he refers to the Old Testament again in verse 11. Whoever believes on him shall not be put to shame. That we who trust in Christ, we're not going to be embarrassed, we're not going to be afraid at the day of judgment, we're not going to be ashamed of this faith. As we live in a world that turns farther and farther away from God, we need to thank him that he has held us close to him through all of these times and trials. In verse 12, he says there's no difference between Jew and Greek. And in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's you and that's me. So our mission then is what? Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? Of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Here's what he's saying. This gospel, our truth, this salvation of ours, how does it get communicated? Well, billboards or television or, or internet and, and all of that might work a little bit, but mostly what is happening here? He says in verse 14, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? They need some basis for believing. And how shall they believe if they have not heard of him? Now, how are they going to hear of him? And how should they hear without a preacher? Well, that's you, Pastor. Okay, right here, a preacher is not really a word being used as the head guy at the church. He's simply meaning, how are they going to hear unless someone proclaims it? A proclaimer. You can be a preacher too. Pastor, do you believe in women preachers? Well, not in women pastors, but I do believe you women can preach the gospel. I believe you can share Jesus Christ with ever, whoever and however and, and, and that God can work through you. But it's Father's Day, so let's remind the men they can do it also. Whether you're the pastor or not, a preacher is simply someone in this case carrying the message. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? Verse 15, how beautiful are the feet. He's quoting from the Psalms. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. We may not think of our feet as being beautiful, but when we do our first blessing shoe ministry, well, the first thing those kids get is they get their feet washed. And you get a look at those feet. And those feet are beautiful because we're hoping at the end of the day those kids have gotten the gospel and they can take that gospel with them also. And it's been this way since the beginning that whoever carries this message about the Lord from Genesis to Revelation to current day, their feet are beautiful. Despite their crooked toes, despite the athlete foot, despite the smell they may have, this message is what makes you righteous. This message is what makes you beautiful. This gospel is what changes things for everybody. And so our mission then is to go. Now, as you go, you realize, oh, pastor, but it's not that easy, is it? No, look at verse 16. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. I'm sorry, verse 16. They have not all obeyed the gospel, right? Isaiah said, who has believed our report? 
We as a church have this message that Jesus Christ died for our sins, rose from the grave, and that that message gives us life. And if we confess with our mouth, yes, Jesus is my Lord, and believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, we are saved. And anyone else we share that message with who believes it and confesses it, they are saved also. That is glorious. But then verse 16 says, you know, they've not all believed our report. And part of our mission is that, you know what, we go and sometimes they receive it and sometimes they don't. It does not take away from the validity. It does not take away from the power. It does not take away from the wonder that is salvation in Jesus Christ. That they choose to reject it. That's why Jesus said, brush the dust off your feet and keep on going. Nobody bats a thousand, not even him. Goodness, he proclaimed love and forgiveness to everybody. And what did they do? They nailed him to a cross. It's not always the most popular message, probably because we have to admit that we are failures and sinners. We come down into verse um, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by what? The Word of God. That this Word from Genesis through Revelation has the power to change people's lives. We do not give up on the Bible. We may not... We may hear it's old-fashioned. We may hear from people that it's no longer relevant. This word still has the power to change people's lives. And that word coming from you to somebody at work, somebody on your street, somebody on your ball team, somebody that you're close to, that word that you share has the power to change them. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Verse 18, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Another psalm being quoted here, another part of the Old Testament to remind us that every dime we give, everything we do as a church helps proclaim this gospel around the globe. Whether it's vacation Bible school like we did last week and us sharing with the children or whether it's the change we're sending out to the hunger fund that will get the gospel around the world to other children. Whether our ties for missions and all the others, they all carry this gospel and it goes everywhere. Your impact goes far beyond 5802 Weber Road. It goes farther beyond this block and this neighborhood and even your house. Because if we carry this gospel and we are faithful in the things of God, it shoots out from us, as he says, to all the earth. See, the Great Commission was going on long before Matthew chapter 28. It was Israel's mission was to be a light to the world. They didn't like that. They liked being their own light and considered themselves too special to share. Some churches are like that. Some Christians are like that. I love the gospel. It saved my soul. But goodness, if I start proclaiming it, what if, what if people I don't like come to know Christ? What if people that are not in my circle, people who are not like me, but this gospel is to go out to every creature. Verse 19. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger. And Isaiah is very bold in verse 20 and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. What is happening? That even those people you don't like, and the Jews had a lot of people they didn't like, which included everybody who wasn't Jewish for a lot of them. But the idea was this. You know what? There were Samaritan women. There were people like the demon-possessed. There were people like the lepers. There were people that were outcast and rejected. But when they heard the message of Christ, they fell down. And God says, now it's found for a people. I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. People who didn't think they'd have any chance of coming to know the Lord, of being in heaven, of having a better life, they all found out this gospel was for them too. But to those who think this gospel is just for us, this gospel is just for us who are the right kind of people and the right color of people. Verse 21, all day long I have stretched out my hand, God says, to a disobedient people 
and contrary. I have been trying to get your attention, church. I've been trying to get your attention, Israel. Using his Old Testament, he's showing this is what it's like these days with church, isn't it? We've got some people that get gloriously saved because they've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got some people that think they're too good to be saved. We've got some people that never get to hear because nobody wants to tell them. Church, he gave us a mission. That we don't care if they're Jewish or white or black or brown or blue or green or whether whatever else they are or may or may not be. People need the Lord. Go and preach to all creatures. Because this message that's been since the beginning, it wasn't way up in heaven where you couldn't find it. It isn't down in the deeps of the sea where you'll never get to it. No, it's right here. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. And others can too. How can they do it? If they hear. If they hear from you. And they hear from me. We do the ministries we do. For instance, the shoe ministry coming up in August. First blessing. We wash their feet. We give them a pair of socks. We measure their feet. We help them shop for a pair of shoes that they don't have to pay for. And we do all of that so we can have the chance to tell them, we think you're important, we think you are loved, and we want to tell you that Christ loves you. They're given Bibles, they're given Bible storybooks. They're, this year we're even going to give the parents a, a harmony of the gospel so the parents get, get to walk home with something. And we do all of this so they can hear from the Word of God that Jesus Christ died for their sins. It's good to give them a pair of shoes, but we really want to give them Jesus. Because that's our mission. And that's why we exist. And that's what makes our feet beautiful and what multiplies the things we do and the impact we have is because we are faithful in these areas. How should they hear? Well, that's why we send missionaries. Well, you know what, God, what if he made each one of us a missionary and said right here in Corpus Christi, where you work, where you serve, the kids you've got that come to you, the neighbors you're with, what if they're the ones who need you to share that message, to be in prayer for them, to lift them up that there might be an opportunity to share this message. This message was given to Moses, it was given to Abraham, it's given to Joshua and David and Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and Solomon and on down the line. And it's given to us. It's given to us because whosoever believes in the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that is the heart of God that all of us should not perish but come to eternal life. And so that's why we do the things we do at church. And why we need to keep that focus. That this is a place that we want to be a place that welcomes new people. People who are like us and not like us. People who are struggling. People who, in a sense, are exactly like us because they need him also. So pray. Pray for our follow-up this summer. Pray for opportunities to meet these new families. Pray that God would work through us. Through the people you meet the waitress at your table, the others who are coming your way in life, pray that God gives you opportunity. Pray that God uses you. Pray that God opens up doors. And, and, and I love a, something I read recently. Just pray our church becomes so full of the Holy Spirit, people can't help but come here. Let's pray for that. That God would do something great and miraculous among us because we're staying faithful to this ancient word that has existed through the millennia and is still ours. That this message still saves people and this message still changed lives and it can change yours also. So in a moment we're going to pray. And when we pray, maybe you want to call upon the name of the Lord or maybe you want to pray and ask, Lord, I need help. I need you to bring someone my way. Let me be your vessel through whom you flow. Let me be that pipe, that conduit. Let me be the one 
who just shares with them something that leads them to you. I'm not asking you to have a whole great big plan of testimony. I'm just asking, tell God you're available. Tell God He can use you and flow through you. That He can speak through you. Would you do that? Let's pray. Father, sometimes we make it hard. We think there's a lot of hoops to jump through. We think we're not strong enough, good enough, trained enough. And Lord, you, you can work so spontaneously in a moment. We say spontaneously, but we know you have it planned. And we know you're powerful enough to work through us in any way you so choose. And so Lord, we're praying that you'll do something through each and every one of us this week. To talk about you, to share about you, to mention you, to, to lift up another person and maybe bring them closer if not all the way to calling out upon your name that they might be saved. We pray for anyone here today who is sitting there saying, can this really be for me also? Can this faith be real? Let them know right now, Lord, it is. And, and it really is like that, that if they would confess with their mouth right now and say to you, Jesus, I need you. You're the only one who can be my Savior. And believe in their heart that God raised you from the dead. Right here, right now. They shall be saved. They shall pass from death to life, from condemnation to heaven. Just like that. What an amazing gospel you've given us. And so we ask you, Lord, to speak through us. To share through us. That we might be your light. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to sing a song and maybe you want to take a step or maybe you just want to come and pray about something. Maybe you're ready to follow Christ. We're all going to stand and we're going to sing. And while we're singing, you're invited to come and let me pray with you about that, all right? So let's stand. You want to take a step? Take a step. Take a step into the aisle and tell God, yes, I'm moving forward. I'm coming closer. And here I go. As we sing, would you come? and go to Jesus. Would you take the step towards Him today? Would you pray for Him to work through you? Would you pray for Him to share this message through you this week? thing it is to be in the arms of Christ. Let's pray that we'll have the opportunity to share that with people in the coming days. Pray that God will use us, all right? Um, it's Father's Day, so we hope you enjoy the afternoon with your family. Uh, pray for one another. We will be back here on Wednesday evening at 6.30 for the prayer meeting and Bible study. We do have a work day planned for Saturday, and uh, so please keep those things in mind. And Rick Villarreal, would you dismiss us, please, sir? Let us pray. Our most precious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, Lord, for allowing us to be here in your house, listen to your word. And Father, just like in the study this morning, Lord, 
because there was somebody who spoke out and told somebody what had happened and what Jesus has done. Father, they had an increase of 3,000 into their church. And Father, it can happen here today if people really believe and go out and witness and we tell others, Lord, all that you had done for us, Lord. And Father, most of all, how you have blessed us by giving us the opportunity to call you Father. And then you gave us earthly fathers to guide and direct us, Lord. And Father, now I pray that you'll be with us every person here, Lord, and they will honor their fathers as they go throughout this day. Father, pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.